what should we do? Should we smoke weed? Of course we should smoke weed. It's good for the soul. Always need that good old double tap. So, what shall we discuss today at uh, Grindhouse Purgatory? Um, you know, Grindhouse films sort of encompass all genres, but what was the genre that basically saved the independent film? You got to realize that, like in the mid '60s, you know, how many uh, monster movies can they churn out, and beach party movies can they churn out? So. Things were a little bit floundering around then, but there was a film back in the 50s uh, shot by uh, Stanley Kramer called The Wild One, and it was a motorcycle uh, gang movie starring Marlon Brando and up-and-comers like um, Lee Marvin and an uncredited Timothy Carey, and it was basically about a bunch of motorcyclists that uh, took over a small town and wreaked havoc. Actually, it was based on something uh, involving the Hells Angels. I believe it might have been a town called Hollister, where there was a mass uh, motorcycle rally and um, several of the uh, Hells Angels were accused of rape. Well, also around that time, Dr. Hunter S. Thompson had put out his book, uh, Hells Angels, The Strange and Terrible Saga of a Motorcycle Gang. And it was a bestseller. Now, you know, the Angels were on Life magazine and were in the spotlight. So, who better than Roger Corman to try and make a biker movie with the Hells Angels? Only he called his movie The Wild Angels. And Peter Fonda was the lead. Uh, Up-and-comers like uh, Bruce Dern and uh, Michael J. Pollard and regulars like Dick Miller were in it. Um, and they also had used uh, members of the, the Hells Angels as extras. Um, life imitated art. Um, Bruce Dern was beat up by two Hells Angels before he could explain that he was making a movie. Um, after the movie was released, uh, the Hells Angels sued uh, Roger Corman for $5 million for defamation of character and also put a hit out on him. Now, Roger had to explain to the guys that if there's a hit out on him, there's no chance of him collecting $5 million, or the Angels collecting $5 million, rather. So that sort of faded away, but the die was cast. Uh, a sequel was in order, but they didn't use Fonda. They used uh, John Cassavetes, who was hot off um, being uh, Franco in the Dirty Dozen. And uh, another, you know, Corman regular, uh, Leo Gordon, was the sheriff. And again, you know, bikers take over a small town and wreak havoc. Well, the die was cast. Um, American International seemed to be like the place where biker movies would be put out, and they were put out in droves. Um, Cycle Savages starred uh, future A-lister Bruce Stern. Another future A-lister, Dennis Hopper, was in one of them. And, of course, don't forget Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda both did Easy Rider, which wasn't really a biker movie, but was considered by some to be. So, all these movies were coming out. And then there was one that put Independent International Pictures on the map. Independent International had been importing stuff and making some domestic horror films and basically... Uh, they were the conduit for the Hemisphere uh, Mad Doctor of Blood Island, Blood Island Trilogy films to come in. So, director Al Adamson made a picture called Satan Sadists, and he cast Russ Tamblin in the lead. Um, his gang was John Bud Cardos, Graydon Clark, um, Richard Dix, a couple other guys. Um, Graydon and uh, Bud, you know, went on to become... Uh, directors and producers. Um, the hero in this one was Gary Kent, who also uh, went on to become a director, uh, writer, and producer. And this was probably one of the most over-the-top, you know, it was what they said it was the grossest biker film of all. It was action-packed. It was a little bit fucked up because there was a lot of rape involved, a lot of fights, a lot of beatings, a lot of murders. Um, Russ Tamblin had stated that it basically ruined his career, but then, really, where were you going after um, West Side Story? I mean, 
you not only did this, but you did, um, oh, uh, the female bunch for Al Adamson, which you got stabbed in the back with a pitchfork. And you also went to Japan, if I remember correctly, and uh, did War of the Gargantua. So as far as ruining your career, I don't see that. But any, anyway, th there was a lot of these films made. Um, they tried one uh, to make a mainstream one called CC and Company with Joe Namath. Um, of course, you know, when you've got an up-and-coming uh, unknown actor that you're trying to push into the mainstream, it pays to surround him with as many great character actors as you can put around him. So the gang behind Joe Namath was consisted of William Smith, Bruce Glover, Sid Haig, and some other uh, recognizable faces. Um, Sid had told me in an interview that he went into the film wanting to hate Joe Namath because he hated athletes that get put up, you know, as big stars, but found out that Joe was a pretty laid-back, likable guy and wasn't, you know, full of himself, so it all worked out. Um, William Smith, uh, they called him almost the John Wayne of the biker films because he did a bunch, including Run, Angel, Run, and they went to the Philippines to shoot this uh, Bikers Against the Viet Cong called The Losers. Now, um, they had uh, not only William Smith, they had Paul Coslow, Adam Rourke, and this guy Houston Savage. And really fucked up thing happened during a dinner that Houston Savage got really fucking drunk and stoned or whatever and started calling his host Gooks. Well, they sort of took him outside and Bill Smith, I guess, saved his life because when Bill Smith went out the side door, they had Houston Smith on... Houston Savage, rather, on his knees out in an alley with a gun pointed toward the back of his head. They were going to blow his ass away. Um, you know, this was, this was dur not during the time when it was fun to shoot in the Philippines. This was when Marcus took over, and it was like almost martial law. And uh, other people that were over there would tell you we were driving around, and, you know, you see these soldiers pull some kid out of whatever, find a butterfly knife on him, and execute him. So it was really tough times over there, and Savage was really lucky to walk away from that with his life. But the film was kind of action-packed. It was uh, produced by Joe Solomon, who did a, a few of these films. And, but they, you know, they, they were tricking out motorcycles with armament, and they had to attack uh, the Viet Cong and save the CIA agents um, from their clutches. Of course, all the good guys die in the end in this one, and, you know, the war goes on. Um, there was a couple other variations. There was one called Werewolves on Wheels, where <laughs> this one was sort of really bad. Some people like it, some people don't, but you don't get to see the werewolves on the motorcycles until almost the end of the picture, and you know they're just wearing full head masks. I believe uh, Billy Gray from Father Knows Best and uh, Seven Darden starred in it. Um, another one that was released by Fanfare, uh, another Joe Solomon deal. Um, then, you know, of course, there was... Um, Hell's Angels on Wheels with Adam Rourke and Jack Nicholson, which also uh, featured uh, members of the Hell's Angels. Um, the one that really, really stood out in my mind was Hell's Angels 69, where they used the president of uh, the Hell's Angels, uh, San Bernardino chapter, uh, I guess, you know, probably the president of the entire uh, outfit, Sonny Barger, and some recognizable names. If you had read Hunter S. Thompson's book, you would recognize names like Magoo, and Terry the Tramp. Terry the Tramp was the guy who went to the studio after the Wild One was shot and bought the striped shirt that Lee Marvin was wearing in the film and wore that shirt. That was his thing. Um, the plot consisted of two rich guys who were going to pull a heist and use the Hells Angels as the version. Um, it was Jeremy Slate and Tom Stern. Tom Stern produced the film. Um, everything was cool except that Tom Stern sort of had a little holier-than-thou attitude as far as the angels go. And um, if I re recall right in an interview, they said that, you know, they were getting to the point where, okay, we're going to let him have it, and I believe that he wound up getting punched out by one of the angels. Uh, Jeremy Slade, on the other hand, was totally respected by them, and when, the, you know, shooting shut down, they handed him a card saying that if you ever get in a problem, you know, call us. And Jeremy said in an interview that he was broken down on the side of the road, and they showed up and helped him out, and all was cool. So, you know, can't judge, judge books by the cover. Some guys are good, some guys aren't so good. But when you, you know, diss them, that's not a fucking good thing. You shouldn't do shit like that. Um, like I said, you know, th these genres... 
you know, had different little things going on, and, you know, the, but the whole thing was their life expectancy was anywhere from seven to ten years. The biker thing sort of petered out after about seven years, but came roaring back uh, probably in the 90s, I think, with uh, Stone Cold, where, the, again, they were trying to push a former athlete, Brian Bosworth, as an undercover cop, you know, infiltrating uh, th this gang. Um, the leaders of the gang were Lance Hendrickson and William Forsythe, two great character actors that can basically carry anybody, even if he's bad. And, you know, Bosworth wasn't that bad, and, you know, uh, Bill Forsythe, when we were talking one time, said, you know, I, goes, I, I, I said, maybe you ought to, like, not be the hero, maybe you ought to try to be the heavy, you might come over better, but I know Bosworth did a couple other straight-to-video films, and I don't know what happened to him. Um... Usually in these films, the bikers are cast as the bad guys, but in a couple instances, they were cast as the good guys. One was the Savage Seven, you know, uh, starring Gary Kent and Bud Cardos and those guys, and this was set like on an Indian reservation, where forces were trying to pit bikers against the Indians, but they were the real bad guys, and in the end, it turned out that, you know, these corporate fucks were the real evil ones, not the bikers and not the Indians. And another one that was shot out, um, I believe around Chicago, I could be wrong, but it used the Scorpions Motorcycle Club in the movie. And the movie was titled The Northvale Cemetery Massacre. And the ad, the poster for the thing, had this huge fat redneck cop, and it said, the day law and order went berserk. And what happened was, um, this cop raped this chick and set the bikers up to take the fall. And... The guy was such a scumbag that he hired a long-distance shooter to try to take out some of these bikers, which they did. I mean, there was some really rotten shit going on with these guys. One guy would go out to take a leak and get popped off by, a, you know, a long-distance shooter, a sniper. So it was a bunch... It was wound up... These cops were a bunch of fucking scumbags, and they were just gunning these guys down. Well, the climactic thing was going to take place in the cemetery where they're going to lay to rest two of their fallen comrades. Now, the cops searched them going in to make sure they didn't have any weapons because scumbag cop and sniper hired a helicopter to go in. Well, what they did was they hid the weapons in the coffins, and when the helicopter showed up and started popping people, they got their weapons. And this was like a total fucking shootout in the cemetery with the bikers getting wasted left and right, male and female. And finally, the helicopter gets taken down, and it winds up with one of those off, you know... Um, Really downbeat 70s endings where the, the survivor of, of the shootout has his gun pointed at the miserable cop, and then it fades to black. But honestly, that film is probably a really, it, you know, not probably, it is a really good film. I saw it, you know, unexpectedly because I don't know what I, you know, when you see Northville Cemetery Massacre, you automatically equate massacre like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, things like that. So we really didn't know what we were going to see, but it, it's a cool little film and it's available on, on, um, uh, DVD as of uh, today, rather. I think VCI put it out. So um, a lot of these films were good. You know, a lot of them segued to, you know, e even the black exploitation people picked up when they cast a bunch of um, ex-NFL players as a motorcycle gang in the Black Six. So yeah, it kept going on and on. And Al Adamson, you know, he had made, like I said, Satan Sadists. He also made a film called Hell's Bloody Devils, which was basically... Looked like parts of three films sort of slapped together with the Bloody Devils as bikers sort of like tying it together. I do believe it was released under a couple other uh, titles. One was called The Fakers, but um, from what I hear, Severn Films is putting together the ultimate Al Adamson box set. So maybe some of these films will show up in there, including maybe The Lost Female Bunch, which was never put out on DVD, and uh, maybe a couple other ones. So, yeah, you know, that, that was our biker uh, genre, you know, and um, like I said, you know, it lasted about seven years. The films were cool, and uh, a lot of the leads became, like I said, A-list players like Dennis Hopper and Bruce Stern. So um, that wraps up this installment of Grindhouse Purgatory, and we'll see you on the flip side. Stay sick.